Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this commemoration of the 330th anniversary of the Battle of Dunkeld, fought here in August 1689, the orphan battle of the Jacobite Wars, neglected, abandoned, largely forgotten, literally fatherless, as the Jacobite leader, Bonnie Dundee, had been cut down by a sniper's bullet at the Battle of Killiecrankie just a few weeks earlier. It's also not part of any family of battles. It's completely unlike any other battle in the Jacobite Wars. And it wasn't fought on open moorland, but here in the city of Dunkeld in a built up urban environment. And like many orphans, we don't know very much about its development. We don't know, for example, even approximately how many soldiers engaged at the battle. More fundamentally, when we're told that the battle ended at 12 o'clock, historians can't tell us whether that means 12 midday or 12 midnight. Now, this isn't just some minor clerical omission or oversight. This is something very fundamental. Even going back to the times of ancient Greece and ancient Rome, we know whether a battle ended nearer to midday than midnight. And you can be assured that with a battle in which several thousand men were engaged, they knew whether it finished at midday or midnight. So how come we don't know? How come the official records are so poor? How come they've been hidden, destroyed or suppressed? Question number one, why was it fought here at Dunkeld at all? We are standing broadly where the defenders that day would have been standing. This is a low-lying valley surrounded by hills in an unwalled city and with the river running behind us. Very vulnerable to attack. Furthermore, the Silvery Tay, which runs behind the cathedral, may seem very calm and serene to us today, but back then in 1689, it's a trap. It's a trap if you're defending this position because it restricts your scope for manoeuvre and more fundamentally, it means you, you cannot retreat. That is your path of retreat. You cannot get out of this position. Some more questions. Why was it, if you're going to defend Dunkeld, that a raw militia formed just three months previously, the Cameronians, were sent to do that job? They had no battle experience. If you're serious about defending this city, why not deploy a regiment of hardened, battle-experienced, professional, regular soldiers? And why were the Cameronians not commanded by their colonel that day, the Earl of Angus? He'd been deployed some miles away from the battlefield together with several companies of the Cameroonians. Could it be that as a noble lord, he was deemed to be too valuable to sacrifice in what seemed to be a suicide mission? And why were the Cameroonians so poorly armed? They were issued, we are told, with just 400 outdated matchlocks, 400 pikes and 40 halberds for the sergeants. I think we've got a halberd here. Well, the halberds were issued to the sergeants. They were deemed to be the best weapons. They had a spike, like a pike. They also had a, a, an axe. So they're a combination of an axe and a pike. They were issued to the sergeants. Now, the, the halberd we have, which has been kindly loaned to us by the armourer Paul MacDonald for this occasion, and which we'll see during the tour, that halberd dates from the 16th century, possibly going back as long as Flodden, and it shows severe signs of battle damage. My point is this, even the halberd was an outdated and antiquated weapon at the time of the Battle of Dunkeld. It's rather as if we sent troops into battle today armed with weapons handed down from the First World War. One final question. It was a, group of cav a troop of cavalry deployed here to Dunkeld under Lord Cardross before the battle. Two troops of horse and three troops of dragoons. They were ordered shortly before the battle to leave the city. Lord Cadross, we know from the records, was so concerned at leaving this position and leaving the infantry to what he saw as certain defeat that he's very reluctant to obey this order. But ultimately, as a loyal officer, he had to follow the command that was given to him. So how can we answer these questions? Well, I would suggest, ladies and gentlemen, that you do not have to be Sherlock Holmes to work out the answer. The Cameronians were being set up to fail. The Williamites didn't seriously expect them to hold Dunkeld at all. The best that could be hoped of them was that they might hold the city for a period, uh, take out a few of the Highlanders and maybe soften them up for the main Williamite army to defeat them further, further south. 
which gives rise to two final questions. Why were the Cameronians deemed to be so expendable, uniquely among the Williamite regiments? And how did they escape the fate which Lord Cardross believed that they would suffer? These are the questions that we will seek to address this afternoon. So, the Cameronians, they were a religious sect founded by the Reverend Richard Cameron. They were covenanters. They followed the adherence to the signatory of the National Covenant, which was signed in Greyfriars Kirkyard in Edinburgh in 1638. This rejected the attempts by Charles I and his bishops to impose their version of Christianity on them. They were Presbyterians. They believed that they could interpret the Bible perfectly satisfactorily for themselves without being told what it meant by King Charles, particularly as during the reign of King Charles's father, James, it had been translated into English in what remains to this day probably the most widely read and most influential book ever published in the English language, the King James Version. But the Cameroonians weren't just moderate Presbyterians who wanted to be, follow their religion in peace and read the Bible as they saw fit with the help of their elders. No, the Reverend Richard Cameron advocated the violent overthrow of the monarchy and the destruction of the Catholic Church. Not surprisingly, the authorities took a rather dim view of this and they sent a posse to hunt him down, which eventually caught up with him in 1680 in a place called Aird's Cross near East Kilbride. The Reverend Cameron did not give himself up peaceably to the forces of the law, not least because he didn't recognise their authority, and furthermore, he thought he had a direct line to the Almighty anyway. Result, a shootout that made a gunfight at the OK Corral look like a children's tea party by comparison, leaving the Reverend Cameron and several of his supporters dead and the rest of them dispersed. At this point, some bright government official had the idea, just to discourage any further nonsense from the Cameronians, of cutting off the hands and the head of the late Richard Cameron and putting them up on spikes at the Netherbow port in Edinburgh. Brilliant. This particular piece of political genius instantly transformed Richard Cameron from being regarded as a dangerous extremist militant during his lifetime to being revered as a holy martyr after his death. So, when William of Orange came over with his Dutch army to try and depose his father-in-law, King James, the second and seventh, a few years later, the Cameronians were among the first to enlist in his support. And William's commander here in Scotland, General Hugh Mackay, on the principle that my enemy's enemy is my friend, happily accepted them into his army, but with some wariness. After all, if the Cameronians had caused such trouble for King James, might they not be equally troublesome for King William when he secured his position on the throne? So, if the Cameronians were willing to be martyrs in the, in the cause, well, who was General Mackay to stop them? And if they happened to take out a few Highlanders in the process, so much the better. It's not just me who thinks that the Cameronians were being set up here in Dunkeld. That's what the Cameronians themselves thought at the time. They were so concerned about the situation in which they found themselves that one of the men went up to their commander, a 28-year-old officer called William Cleland, and said, the boys are concerned that you and the other officers are going to get on your horses and ride off and leave us here when the, when the Highlanders appear on those hills. No, nope, said Cleland, that's not going to happen. Well, how can we be sure you're not going to ride off into the sunset like Lord Cadross? And Cleland looked him in the eye and he said, I'll tell you how you can be sure because I'm going to go out there right now and I'm going to shoot all the officers' horses. Well, in the event the horses didn't get shot, the men said, we trust your word as a man of honour. And sure enough, the following morning when the Highlanders appeared over there on Gallows Hill, there on Socky's Hill at dawn, the officers and the men were standing together. And many men that day fell in the cause in which they fought on both sides. Among the first to fall, was a 28-year-old Lieutenant Colonel William Cleland himself. He was hit during the first Highland assault. He was hit in the liver and in the head. And he knew he was finished, so he tried to crawl into a nook to be out of the sight of his men so that he wouldn't become disheartened by watching him die. Command of the regiment then fell to his second-in-command, Major James Henderson. 
Henderson was also killed in the initial Highland assault, as was Lieutenant Henry Stewart of Livingston. He fell at the Market Cross where he was manning a company uh, defending the, the, the Market Cross. So command of the regiment now fell to Captain George Munro. He was a senior surviving officer. By this time, one question is, did the battle go on till midnight or did it end at midday? I submit there are five pieces of evidence that so strongly suggest to me it must have been over by midday. First, the initial Highland charge was a shock tactic. Didn't last very long. The Highlanders came charging down the hills to hit their opponents at maximum speed and either they broke their enemy line or they'd be broken by it. And as we know from the battles of the 45 at Preston Pans at Falkirk Muir, where they broke the enemy line, finally at Culloden, where obviously they were broken by the Redcoat line, the charge did not last very long at all. Half an hour at the very most would decide the battle. So by eight, eight o'clock in the morning, we know that the Cameronian officers, Cleland, Henderson and Stewart were either dead or dying. By this time, the Cameronians, as it happened, with their pikes and their halberds, were holding off the Highland Charge reasonably effectively because they had a longer reach. But they were being forced into their second line of defence, which was the buildings in this area. Most of them, and this, at that time, this was a great city with lots of wooden buildings around the cathedral. They were wooden and they had thatched roofs, so it didn't take the, the Highlanders very long to work out. We can set them afire, which they did. So the Cameroons were forced back into their core defensive position. Here, in the cathedral, in a mansion called Dunkeld House, which was a mansion of the Marquis of Argyle, uh, sorry, of Athol, which was over in that field there at that time, no longer exists. And in three houses adjoining the cathedral, the rectory, the manse, and the dean's house. All these buildings were made of stone or brick, and all of them had lead roofs. So, locked in there, the Cameroonians were for the moment safe, because they couldn't be set alight. But my second piece of evidence is we know they didn't have very much ammunition. In fact, the records show they had to strip the, ro the roofs of lead to manufacture makeshift shot. So how long could they have lasted with so little ammunition and no water? Not, I suggest, 15 hours or 18 hours until midnight. Third piece of evidence, which we'll see today, the evidence of these walls themselves. There is evidence of musket shot, of pitting. So they were clearly fired upon by the Jacobites. But I submit that the shot is not so extensive as to suggest a siege that went on for 15 or 18 hours. It's more consistent with an attack that lasted maybe a couple of hours. Fourth piece of evidence. You've got to get to the mindset of the Cameronians trapped in here. Captain Munro and his fellow lieutenants. They know if they stay there, their fate is sealed. They can't get out. They're trapped. There's no cavalry going to come out over those hills for them. They've been abandoned here by the Williamites. Their only hope is to do or die by trying to counterattack and break out and hit the Jacobites. How long would it have taken them to work that out? I suggest it would not have taken them 15 hours to work out. They'd have known that within an hour or two. And that's exactly what they do. They come out with, with blazing faggots on their pikes and set fire to the remaining houses where the Jacobite musketeers are firing at them. And in one account, it's stated that 16 Highlanders died in one house where they were trapped. Also, the, the, the Cameroonian counterattack was very vicious. It was brutal. They, it was do or die. They knew they had nothing to lose. So at that point, the Jacobites withdrew or break, broke and ran. And this is the fifth and for me, the clinching piece of evidence. All the records of the battle state that among the Cameroonians, there was joy, there was relief, there was psalms sung to the Almighty for their salvation, as one would expect. However, that's only consistent if the withdrawal happened in broad daylight. If it had happened at midnight, they wouldn't have been aware the Jacobites had withdrawn. They'd have been aware they maybe had withdrawn, but they wouldn't have known they'd got disappeared entirely. They might have thought they're up in the hills waiting to, for another attack, or there'll be a renewed assault at dawn. There's no way they could have been sure that the Jacobites had gone if the retreat had happened at, at, after darkness. Indeed, a retreat after darkness would have been entirely normal in such circumstances, whereas a retreat at midday would have been unexpected. So, why did the Jacobites withdraw when they seemed to be on the point of victory? Well, according to their commander, Colonel Alexander Cannon, they'd run out of ammunition. This account has been challenged, 
as self-serving because obviously it would relieve Colonel Cannon of any responsibility for retreating just at the point of victory. A more compelling explanation is that the Jacobites were spooked by seeing their own comrades burned alive in their houses and that by the sheer ferocity of the Cameroonian counter-attack. And this is borne out by the remaining accounts of the battle. The Jacobites said, we can fight with men, we cannot fight with devils. And the most enduring poem about the battle concludes, you fought like devils, your only rivals, when we met you at Dunkeld. So, to conclude, what is the final legacy of Dunkeld? I would highlight three. The first and most immediate and most obvious is that it turned the tide of the Civil War of 1689 decisively away from King James and his Jacobite supporters and towards William of Orange. After Dunkeld, the Jacobite army dwindled, it never regained its previous strength, and the Jacobites in Scotland suffered a final defeat at Cromdale in 1690. King James tried to regain his throne then through Ireland, but his army was defeated at the Battle of the Boyne, and then finally at the Battle of Orgrim, fought on July 12th, 1691. And as we know, he never did regain his throne. The second legacy of Dunkeld is it pointed to the very significant advantages enjoyed by defenders in an urban battle. They can dig into the most secure positions, they, whereas the attackers are exposed in the open and vulnerable to counterattack. And the third and final legacy is this. This great and ancient cathedral has stood here for many centuries and seen much joy, but also much sadness and suffering, as it did on that fateful day in August all those years ago. And it serves as an enduring memorial and reminder of that day and of the dangers of intolerance and intransigence, which can lead to escalating conflict and violence. And so today we'll finish our brief tour with a commemoration at the monument to the battle, which is here in the cathedral grounds. And remember with respect and honor the men on both sides who died that day and whose last mortal remains lie here still. And also to say a prayer that never again shall civil conflict threaten in this country our lives, our liberty and our happiness. We were discovered, this was all put together by the fact that uh, we felt it was the forgotten battle. I mean, kill a cranky, kill a cranky every year. And if anything, this was a far more brutal and uh, uh, a more, imp I think when you say more important, but it changed the ball game totally. The, the Jacobites thought they were, this, they would, I think they kind of felt, they, I feel the Jacobites felt they could walk into Dunkeld. And it was the total opposite, you know. You can't do Jacobite history without the religious thing. But what you've got to understand, people think it's a freight Protestant Catholic. And half of Scotland was Episcopalian at the time. So, you know, there's a lot of confusion on, on, on that one. And even when you get to Bonnie Prince Charlie's Jacobite army, the Camerons the, of Lochiel, he was a very modern thinking man. You could take service in his regiment as a Presbyterian, as a Catholic, and an Episcopalian on a Sunday morning quite cool for its, for, for its time. So there's a lot of misconceptions on that. But we've got a beautiful, and I think you agree that the actual setting is absolutely beautiful here. It's a fantastic area. And, but again, the locals, a piece of their history that they don't overly talk about. The Scots are horrendous at doing their own history. And what, and like all nations, some American here, I particularly study the American Civil War because if you understand the American Civil War, you understand America today. And I believe in Britain, if you study 1688 to 1746 particularly, or just after that, 1788, 100 years, you will understand why Britain is today and all the problems that we have. And, and you know, again, if you don't know the history, but for me being into, enjoying history, when you actually stop and look at that, and you see the actual mark, they're not ac accurate, these muskets, in these days, and they, weren't, they were even a lot better by 1745, with the Brown Basin coming into play in the British Army particularly. And, uh, but 
if a musket round hit you, you were basically had it, you know, because it tore you, it tore you apart, and particularly shattered bones. And that's that's it. you can physically see. I mean, bear in mind that stone has been weathered for 330 years since the action, and see how deep some of these marks still are. So if you were on the receiving end of that, and uh, if didn't Colonel Cleland, who, as Mike pointed out, went down quite early in, in, in the battle, uh, crawled into a corner. I mean, if he got hit in the liver and hit in the head with that, you know, the man was, would have been pretty. But again, in fairness to him as a, as a commander, the bravery of trying to crawl into a corner and expire quietly so that he's not dying in front of these men. That, that is due a note of irrelevant of your affiliation to any, any other side of the cause. That is bravery beyond the call of duty. And he lost his life, I think, at the age of 25. You know, a hor horrendous thing. But basically, there was a, a V shape. Uh, what's behind you, basically, is the, the, technically the new town of Dunkeld. Right. Dunkeld was like a, like a pair of Y fronts left and right of the cathedral here basically and buildings going down the side here so either side of there's buildings down the side towards the river there as well uh, uh but uh, right foot out the gates here as we came up you seen you seen the square in the, the down there well there was a barricade down there again with the, the, the cameronians and again a phenomenal defense was put up there I just, I just think, you know, and again, I make me the point of people being burnt to death, thatched roofs. That it was that intense. I mean, they were running out of musket shot. They were ripping lead off roofs, melting it, trying to make balls. So, you know, uh, but it was just incredible. And bear in mind that many of the Highlanders were reasonably okay with their weapons. The Highland, they were, some of them were warriors. The Cameronians were four months into this as a regiment. So it was, if you look at even the Napoleonic era, a regiment that isn't very good, and Napoleon sends in his old guard, his, his SAS. You know, these other regiments are not going to stand. So uh, I, I, I think it's good that the Cameronians will be here next week commemorating the bravery of their men, but also the bravery of the Jacobites. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've had fun and I hope it inspires you to learn more about the period of history. The, these two different roses are intertwining with one another. This is in peace and commemoration of the groups, the people who were here, their, their humanity and their mortality. They were all humans, and both probably sides equally believed in their cause. So we are a very lovely group of people at the 45, very peace-loving, and thus, which I think signifies memory of all the fallen and those who fought here on that rather bloody day at Dunkeld. Uh, so I'll, I'm honoured away this on behalf of the association and a minute silent once I've weighed it then then Bob will speak. Ladies and gentlemen let us pray. Almighty God we remember with respect those who lost their lives in the Battle of Dunkeld. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the peace we have enjoyed in this country for centuries and for the opportunities for reconciliation. Eternal God, in whose perfect kingdom no sword is drawn but the sword of righteousness, and no strength is known but the strength of love, so guide and inspire the work of all who seek your kingdom that the nations may find their security not in force of arms, but in that perfect love which casts out fear through Jesus Christ our Lord.
Amen.